grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet sung by flaming tongues above. Praise his name, I'm fixed upon it, name of God's redeeming sought me when a stranger wandering from the fold of God he to rescue me from danger bought me with his precious blood Hello and welcome everyone to online worship at East Heights United Methodist Church. My name is Steve Spencer, one of the pastors of our church, and I'm so glad you joined us today. If you're with us for the first time or you've been logging in from the very start, thank you for participating in this worship experience. As we begin our time together, will you join me now in our call to worship? Lord, open my lips and my mouth will give you praise. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. Now Pastor Kim has a special message for our children. Well, good morning, kids. I am here in my kitchen, and I am excited because I am going to have some macaroni and cheese. Do you remember this? Maybe you've had some recently. Oh, I am just so excited um, to, to try out this mac and cheese. Oh, something's not quite right. It's hard. It's crunchy. And it doesn't taste like mac and cheese. What's the problem? Oh, that's right. We have to make it first, don't we? So how could I make it? What do I have to do? That's right. I have to put it in water and I boil it on the stove, don't I? And then what? That's right. I have to go over to my sink and pour all the water out. Then what happens? Can I have it right after that? 
Oh, to get it cheesy, we have to add this packet. That's right, and some butter and some milk and then stir it all up and that's how you make mac and cheese, isn't it? Yeah. Well, you know, these dry, hard, yucky noodles that kind of make a bounce on the floor, <laughs> they remind me of a scripture passage from Ezekiel. When God took the prophet Ezekiel to a valley of dry bones, and there God said, Ezekiel, tell those dry bones to come to life. Kind of like we tell this mac and cheese noodle to come to life so that we can eat it. And do you know what? Those dry bones, they did come to life when Ezekiel told them to do that. You know, these dry bones, they can kind of represent for us some challenges in our life, right? You know, kids, when you were told back in March that you were going to have to do school at home and you weren't going to get to see your friends or your teachers or do the sports that you've normally been doing, I kind of wonder if you felt like one of these hard noodles, kind of dry, kind of yucky. But believe it or not, You've made it. We are here in the last week of school. And I hope that just like when God and Ezekiel came and told those dry bones to live, I hope that during these months when you've been at home working hard on schoolwork and um, just life in general, working hard at home, um, that maybe, maybe, God has entered in and offered something delicious, like when we enter in and make this mac and cheese. Let's have a prayer. Oh God, sometimes life is hard. Sometimes it feels like there is nothing good, nothing living. But we know that when you come and when you enter into our lives, even the hard times can be made good. And we thank you for that. Amen. There is a worksheet that goes along with our um, children's message on the website for you today. And there's also a video on the children's portion of the website where I talked to the kids this week about temptation and what the spider and the spider's web can um, sometimes teach us. Hey, parents, I want to say a good job to you as well for filling in for your kids' teachers and, and helping them get through these last nine weeks. I, all, I hope you all have a wonderful week, and I'll see you again next time. Be sure to go to our children's page on our website, and you'll find activity pages there for our young disciples. Now let's take a look at all that's going on in the life of our church. Here's a look at some of the events and activities at East Heights UMC. For a full list, please check your inbox or visit our website at ehumc.org. Family Life Class invites you to join the Unafraid Zoom Study Sundays at 10 a.m. Learn to identify fears and discover practical tips for overcoming them, all in the light of Scripture and faith that promises again and again that we can live with courage and hope. Please email Pastor Kim to receive the link or if you have any questions. We're still planning to have our Sale of the Century Garage Sale fundraiser just at a later date. We'll begin accepting donations soon, so be sure to save all of those bags of items you cleared out during the stay-at-home order. Please contact Paige Nelson with any questions you have or for more information. The United Methodist Open Door is in need of volunteers. For more information, please contact Volunteer Coordinator Tim Stead at 316-267-4201. Thank you for your interest in helping those in need in our community. You can support East Heights and its ministries by giving through our website, our church giving app, or by mail. We appreciate your generous support. Thank you for joining us at East Heights UMC, where we seek to love God, love neighbor, and serve the world.
You might have heard the expression, where there is no prayer, there is no power. Where there is little prayer, there's little power. And where there is much prayer, there is much power. I invite you now to join me as we faithfully and boldly lift up our prayers to our God. Let's pray. Steadfast and loving God of us all, we come to you with concerns and joys that fill our thoughts. Help us to love more wisely, to live more genuinely, to learn more steadily. May we seek to base our lives on the love of Christ, that from day to day we may be passionate and patient, faithful and forgiving in loving one another and this world of many people with many differences. Through the Spirit, build your church into a living sign of your presence on earth. And hear us now, Lord, as we pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen.
This morning we will conclude our study on the Apostles' Creed. In the past couple of weeks, we've learned that this is a statement of faith used by Catholics and Protestants alike. It is called the Apostles' Creed because it summarizes the core teachings of Jesus' closest followers, the first disciples. And creed comes from the Latin word credo, which means I believe or I trust. The Apostles' Creed consists of 12 statements of faith that serve as a concise summary of church teachings or doctrine that articulate the core of Christian belief. Will you join me now as we recite this creed together? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Last week we covered the meaning behind the statements, the Holy Catholic Church and the communion of saints. Today we'll explore the final three statements of this creed, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. What comes to mind when you hear the word sin? It's probably not one of the top 10 things we like to think about or talk about. But if we're honest with ourselves, we'll realize that sin is a part of our human existence. Sin reveals itself in individual acts of saying or doing things we know to be wrong. And it also occurs on a global scale where thousands of lives are affected by the greed or selfish actions of others. While the Apostle Paul does approach sin on a global cosmic level, his basic understanding seems to be a bit more personal. In his letters to believers in Rome, Paul asserts that if unchecked, sin has the power to take hold and control a person's life. We might look at sin as something similar to an addiction. At the beginning of the addiction, a person freely chooses to ingest the addicting substance, uh, but soon that substance controls them to the point that their life is dominated by seeking that next drink or the next fix. So the person has both bought into the addiction, addiction at one level while also being overwhelmed by it on another. Eventually, it is the sin that dwells within that is in charge. This is a picture of our dog, Maddie. She's been with us now for over 10 years and we love her very much. She's a great friend to our family and a wonderful protector. But several years ago, Maddie had a problem that got her into a bit of trouble. Normally when we would leave the house and return, Maddie would be right there at the door when we got home. She would be all excited to see us like it was as if we'd never be coming back. And there were times, though, that when we'd go out and we'd be back on an errand and we'd come back to the house, there'd be times when Maddie wouldn't go to see us. She wouldn't be there at the door to greet us. And she, instead, she went into hiding. It was then we knew that something was up. Something was out of sorts. And it's then when we walked into the, the uh, kitchen that we could see that Maddie was hiding for a reason. You see, she had gotten into the garbage and it was all over the kitchen floor. This wasn't like Maddie. She normally didn't do this. Eventually, she'd walk into the kitchen to see what, what's going on and you could see just the guilt written over her face. Maddie, I'd ask, did you do this? And she'd lower her head and, and her tail would go between her legs and she'd run out of the room. Maddie knew what she had done was wrong, but in a sense, she couldn't help herself. I wonder if many of us can relate to this. Maybe we've been tempted by things we know to be wrong, but we do them anyway. 
In chapter 6 of Romans, the Apostle Paul calls unbelievers uh, to live a life free of sin through faith in Jesus and to live into the reality that they are children of God. And in chapter 7, he expresses a tension between uh, those of us who seek to follow the way and be guided by the Spirit of God while living in a sinful and broken world. He writes, So the trouble is not with the law, for it is spiritual and good. The trouble is with me, for I'm all too human, a slave to sin. I don't really understand myself, for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? I believe the struggle that Paul describes in our scripture reading connects with many of us who claim to be followers of Jesus. We all know what it's like to want to do something we're not supposed to, to have something we're not supposed to have, to go where we're not supposed to go. All these things destroy uh, what God has meant to be good. We all have sinned and fallen short spiritually and emotionally by what we've put into our minds or even put into our bodies. We've done things to ourselves and to others. Our sin has led us to turn away from God and do things we know are not pleasing in His sight. The Apostle Paul wrote honestly about these moments when he realized that his actions didn't match the ideals he sought to live by. Like Maddie, we sometimes fall short in our struggle to live the way we are called to live. Has there been a time in your life when you realize that you've fallen short of God's uh, standard? And like Paul, felt miserable about that. At those times, don't forget Paul's answer to his own question when he, question when he says this. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Thank God the answer is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Paul's answer to that question is that Jesus did something for us that we could never do on our own initiative or power. Sin may continue to assault us like a deadly addiction. It can take away uh, our lives. It can overwhelm us. But its victory will never be complete or permanent. The war between God and sin rages within us and can make us miserable, but we can be confident about the outcome. In the next chapter, Paul would go on to declare this in Romans 8, 1 through 3. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to Him, the power of the life-giving Spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. For Paul, this is a believer's declaration of freedom. In it, he declares the spiritual freedom we enjoy because of our union, our connection with Jesus Christ. Life in the Spirit is life set free from the bondage to self and to sin. It is life under the direction and lordship of Jesus. The power of that lordship has broken the enslaving power of sin, and it sets us free to enjoy a new connection, a new relationship with God. You know, Paul often wrote about sin and the saving grace of Jesus. He also had much to say about the next statement in the Apostles' Creed, the resurrection of the body. Christians believe that through Jesus' death and resurrection, God gave a definitive answer to the question of life beyond death. His son, Jesus, was crucified, dead and buried. His friends watched him be placed in a sealed tomb. And those same friends claimed that Sunday morning, Jesus stepped out of that tomb. Some years later, the Apostle Paul, who had first rejected Jesus and even persecuted his first followers, would have his own encounter with the risen Lord. In 2 Corinthians 5, 1 through 5, Paul had this to say about the resurrection. For we know that when this earthly tent we live in is taken down, that is when we die and leave this earthly body, 
we will have a house in heaven, an eternal body made for us by God himself and not by human hands. We grow weary in our present bodies and we long to put on our heavenly bodies like new clothing. For we will put on heavenly bodies. We will not be spirits without bodies. We groan and sigh. But it's not that we want to die and get rid of these bodies that clothe us. Rather, we want to put on our new heavenly bodies so that these dying bodies will be swallowed up by life. God himself has prepared us for this. And as a guarantee, he has given us his Holy Spirit. Paul was a tent maker. And here he used a tent as a picture of our present earthly bodies. A tent is a weak temporary structure without much beauty. But the glorified body we will one day receive will be eternal, beautiful, and never show signs of weakness or decay. Paul saw the human body as temporary. It was a momentary structure, but he knew that believers would one day receive a wonderful glorified body suited to the glorious environment of heaven itself. What will our resurrected bodies be like? Well, we don't know for sure, but we do know that we will be the product of a radical transformation. Our bodies will be very different and more glorious. In this passage, Paul is telling us that this present condition of fading life, however troubling it may be, is not without hope. God has begun a transforming process in each believer that will one day be completed when we receive our heavenly bodies and perfect Christ-likeness. This vision offers us a glimpse of what it might look like to experience the resurrection. But what happens after that? What happens when we die? Paul offers us an answer to part of that question, stating that we will be made perfect in Christ and given bodies fit for our heavenly home. But what will eternal life look like? Is death the end of our existence or is there something more? That's a question that I imagine has been asked by men and women from the beginning of time. Maybe you have wondered that yourself. Most major religions of the world have grappled with this question and offer their own understanding of what they believe eternity will look like. Islam, Islam pictures the world to come as a paradise or an abode where believers are rewarded in the afterlife for what they did in this life. And Buddhism offers a set of directions to live by with the purpose of being freed from all desire and suffering and ultimately will achieve the, the goal of nirvana. Now, Hinduism teaches there is a continuous cycle of rebirth called reincarnation with the purpose of evolving through experience over long periods of time. And pop culture versions of Christianity picture heaven as a place where you are dressed in white clothes. Maybe you have some wings on your back and you float around in the clouds. Now, the Apostle John offers a very different picture of eternal life. In Revelation 21, 1 through 7, he says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared, and the sea was also gone. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, Look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. And the one sitting on the throne said, Look, I am making everything new. And then he said to me, Write this down, for what I tell you is trustworthy and true. And he also said, It is finished. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To all who are thirsty, 
I will give freely from the springs of the water of life. All who are victorious will inherit all these blessings, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. God has promised his people a new heaven and a new earth. The old creation must make way for the new creation, a creation that is characterized by God once again being among his people. The new heaven and the new earth that God has planned for us is very much like the paradise he created for Adam and Eve. It will be characterized by a perfect relationship with God, fullness of life, beauty and work, discovery and satisfaction. This is what awaits for us in the future. Best of all, God will make his home with us and we will enjoy a new intimacy with God which is impossible in a world where sin and death are present. This new heaven and new earth will be without sorrow. God will wipe away every tear from our eyes and death with, with its suffering and pain and sorrow will vanish for the old order of things will have passed away. Friends, the Apostles' Creed, which began with an affirmation, affirmation in belief in God, now concludes with a great expectant hope that one day soon we will be made perfect, blessed in full, and enjoying the presence of God for all eternity. Now, I realize you may be going through a difficult time right now in your life. You might have questions and there are a few answers to come. Whatever your situation may be, my hope and prayer is that you will draw close to God, a God who loves you dearly and won't let anything separate you from Him. I thank you for joining us for this time as we've been exploring the Apostles' Creed. I, I prayed that you'll have new understanding. It will give you a new sense of who you are and whose you are in God. With that spirit, will you join me now? Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, from the beginning to the end, you have always been with us and always dealt with us gracefully. By grace, you created us for a life of intimacy with you and engagement in your world. By grace, you raised us to newness of life in Jesus from a life of sin, rebellion, and death. By grace, you relate to us every moment of every day being steadfast in your love and faithfulness in your wisdom. For such a rich standing in grace, Lord, we praise you and we give you thanks. We adore you and we lift up our prayers in Jesus' name. I'm so glad that you joined us for worship today. If you've been encouraged by this experience, please share it with a family member or a friend. And as we end our time together, I pray that God blesses you in this day and the days to come and that you might be a blessing to someone else, that you might be a, a light in the midst of their darkness. And we'll conclude our time together with our Spirit of Live band singing All the Way My Savior Leads Me. All the way my Savior leads me Who that you ask how could I doubt his tender mercy who through life has been my guide all the way my Savior leads me and cheers each winding path I tread i
Speed. 